using the seventh generation navigation. Paul Pearson is going to be presenting it. Uh, I'm Craig Kaiser. I'm facilitating the meeting. <clears throat> um, I think you'll find Paul to be a very knowledgeable, very informative, very good at explaining uh, what is going on, what the material is all about. Uh, you'll take a lot away from this meeting, uh, seminar, from what he has to present. Um, I don't know anyone who is anywhere close to Paul in their knowledge of the NAS system. He's been working on quite a few different generations now. Feel free to ask Paul questions during the presentation as they come up. However, if, if we start to lose continuity of the seminar and uh, start running out of time, we may ask you to hold the remaining questions until the end of the seminar. And then I'll come around with the hand mic uh, so that when you ask the question, everyone can hear it. Um, and so we can minimize the time required to get everyone to understand the question and the answer. Um, also, at the end, we do have a, a DVD seven bin map system if you'd like a copy. We do ask though you just take one because we are limited to the quantity we have and we have another seminar to give uh, in the same topic later during this event. Okay? Is that, so, that DVD, is that going to be this, this yes. PowerPoint? This particular yes. Program. So with that, I will welcome Paul Pearson. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Thanks, everyone. Um, did anybody come to the Labor Day event and attend my, navig my navigation seminar? Okay, just so you're aware, this is basically going to be a reprise of that seminar. The better news this time, though, is we've got 90 minutes, so we'll be able to get to some questions at the end. We were a little time crunched at the, uh, the Labor Day event just because of the volume of things that were going on. Um, Fred, thank you very much for the kind words and the introduction. Fred and I have been doing these seminars for a long time. He's managed to always get to be my facilitator, and I, I think he could probably start giving the seminars at this point because he's had to listen to me do this so much. <clears throat> um, you'll bear with me. I've got a little hoarseness, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk through it if possible. Um, first things first, I always like to open with uh, a couple of new business pieces or old business, if you will. Um, I get asked to present some different things. So, first one is this one. If you have a PDR, just a reminder that the data slot that you should be using for the SD card is actually the card slot in the glove box, not the one in the center console. Some folks are mixing that up and actually headed back to their dealer with problems, and it's only because they've put their data card in the wrong slot. So, um, I was asked to just put a refresher, a reminder out there about that. So, that's one piece. The next one, slide's titled, What's Next? And I put on there, If I Had My Way. Well, I hear from a lot of owners that if it were up to them or if GM had asked me or if I had my way, things would be different. Things would be this way. I'd have done this. Well, here's your chance. There are two engineers from Warren Tech Center that are down. They're positioned outside near the 16 model year cars on the back of the museum. And um, Pranav and Jason are out there, and they are looking for owner feedback. They are working currently on the next generation instrument panel cluster, and they are working on the next generation heads up display. And they would appreciate it if you would come and spend some time with them. They want your feedback on the current system, and they want to ask you some questions about things that are being considered for the new system. So if you've ever wanted to get your two cents in, here's your chance. They're going to be here all weekend. Actually, their table is in the same spot, and they're going to be there for all three days of the event, so all day today, tomorrow, and Saturday. So please go and visit with them. They want to see everybody. OK, let's get started. Um, if this were a university course, this would be Navigation 101. So just to kind of frame the topic and the content that we're going to be covering today. Nothing earth shattering. Um, it's basically just an attempt to demystify the navigation system that's in the Stingray. I've been doing this on, on navigation in the Corvettes since the 2008 model year. Um, so I started back in early 2007 working with usability, if you will, of the navigation systems. Um, so I've been through the generation change. Uh, back in August of 2013, I presented an introduction to the infotainment system. So this is picking up on that topic, and this is just uh, feature familiarization, I'll call it. Okay. 
So um, in terms of what we're going to be covering today, we're going to be just doing a brief overview on setting up the system menu. We're going to talk about navigation system basics. Um, a section I just called DNO, it's a little additional features piece. Um, where you can find all of this on the web, I maintain a personal website. You can download all of the tutorials that I mentioned today. Um, if you do get a CD at the end of the presentation this morning, they're all contained on that CD. This PowerPoint presentation is contained in PDF format so you can view it. Um, the seminar is being videotaped and the video will be up on that website once it gets compiled and I get it uploaded. Um, you'll be able to download that, download the PDF of the PowerPoint, and then you'll be able to follow along the presentation a second time. So, um, And last is just a Q&A period at the end, but as Fred said, we're going to try to take questions as we go through the seminar. If an answer is going to take too long, I might ask if we could table it till the end, or if we start to lose flow, or if I see more people than usual nodding off, <laughs> then we'll, we'll try to move past that. So here we are a year later. Me, a few less hairs on top and a few more pounds on the middle. Here we go. Okay, setting up the system. You've bought a new or used Stingray. Um, unless it was a museum delivery, odds are someone else has touched the inside of your car when you got it. Sometimes salesmen use cars that come into dealerships to familiarize themselves with the system and you would be very, very surprised at what gets left behind. Their phone might still be paired. Um, their home address might still be entered. So it's a really good idea to go in and restore the system defaults through the settings menu on the home screen. Set up your user preferences. Put in your home location, and I put in parentheses a close proximity to your home location. A lot of people argue that it's not a good idea to put your home address in a navigation system in your vehicle. If someone steals your car, they know you're out because you now don't have a car any longer, and they just drive to your house. The reality is your insurance card is likely in the car or your registration is in the glove box. All of that same information is on those pieces of paper. It's very easy for them to get their hands on anyway, so do with that what you will. If you're concerned about such things, maybe put the closest police station to your house as your home address. I, I like to tell people to read the owner's manual only because it sends more people to my website once they do. Um, the owner's manual is accurate for the most part. It is complete, but it is a bit of a challenge to get through. It's not very interesting reading. It's not very exciting material. I try to do this more in a step-by-step, -step, first time somebody's never looked at the system before, and just walk through. So all of the information that we're talking about in this presentation is available in a user tutorial. It's about a 35-page document that basically steps through in much greater detail the things that we're covering today. How to enter a destination, how to work with the points of interest that are available. Um, so it'll talk through a little bit more detail on the stuff that we're going to see today. So this is, a, this is an overview and, and please take some time to practice because you, you need to feel comfortable with interacting with the system. If you're not comfortable as you're using it, it's a distraction. And then that becomes a bigger issue when you're on the road. And it adds to frustration for the owner. So setting up the system piece. I brought up the main menu and I added a little piece to this year's presentation. At the top of each of the main section slides, I tried to put the commands that you're looking for to get you there. So to get to this menu from the navigation screen, you can either press the menu button that's the hard key down above the HVAC controls. Or if you've tapped the screen, you can bring up the menu key that's all the way over to the right. And here's the order of the things that are on this menu. End and resume route, navigation voice preferences, current location, traffic map view, and so on. Um, so familiarize yourself with those things. I'm going to talk a little bit on the next slide about routing and setting up the system. Set up your view preferences. Now the good news with the view preferences is at any time, you know, you've got 3D view, heading up view, and north up. You can change that any time from the map screen. Just by pressing the navigation icon again in the quick launch tray, it will cycle through those views. So if you want more detail, less detail, or to change the point of view, um, you can do that just by tapping the nav icon. This is probably the most important takeaway 
Make sure you select use freeways. I've had more customers come to me, use freeways was off, and they couldn't figure out why the nav system was taking them so far out of the way to get to places that should have been one exit up the road from their house. And it's just a matter of somebody in trying to familiarize themselves with the system, tapping screens, playing with buttons. They've actually turned it off, and that's where we've ended up. Without used freeways, it's a very, very long journey. Root style. Root style determines the type of guidance that the system is going to provide. It's a little bit different. You remember with the C6, for those that had a C6 navigation, one very nice feature that we lost in the C7 was the three routes button. You could always view the quickest, the shortest, and normal when you would press the three routes button after you entered a destination. We don't have that. The system wants you to tell it up front which type of route guidance you would like it to provide. And you have three choices. You have fastest, you have eco-friendly, and you have short. I, I, unless you want a very good laugh, stay away from the edit eco button on a 2014 Corvette. It's unfortunately a carryover profile from another sedan. So the options in your eco profile that you can edit are whether or not you have a roof rack on the car <laughs> or if you are towing a trailer. Sorry. Sorry. So. Fast is going to default to multi-lane, higher speed limit roads. It's going to avoid roads that you might normally take as your preferred shortcut because it is very literal. When you tell it to take the fastest route, it is going to take the fastest route. And if it's faster by one mile per hour on a speed limit sign than another route that you're familiar with, it is going to choose that route. It also doesn't care if it's longer distance-wise. If it's 20 miles longer, but it has an average speed of 70 miles an hour on the freeways versus 20 miles shorter, and there's a lot of back roads at 35 and 40 miles per hour, it's going to put you on the highway. It's frustrating to some folks because they get in the car and they want to interact with it either like their Garmin, this is not a Garmin, or they want to interact with it like they were intuitively thinking towards the system and it's going to understand what they're saying. No, you should be taking this road. And it doesn't, don't get frustrated, understand what its priorities are. If you tell it fastest, its priority is to get you there the fastest way that it can possibly get you there. Eco-friendly is going to come closest to the normal routing from the C6. It's going to use a mix of highways and back roads. The way that I'd like to describe this is if up where the arrow is in route style, if that was your destination, and down where the menu Chevron is, that's your origination, if you choose fastest and the freeway goes like this, that's how it's going to go fastest. If shortest is back roads but it's slightly fewer miles, that's how it's going to choose for shortest, and eco-friendly is going to do some combination of the two and it's going to route you across the middle. Remember, it doesn't understand neighborhoods, it doesn't understand road surface quality, it doesn't understand any of those things. If all of the roads meet the criteria that you have established in your routing preferences, using freeways, using toll roads, using um, time-limited roads, it will use all of them, even if it's cutting through the worst section of the worst city in America. Keep that in mind also when you're planning your trip. You can always view what it's telling you. You can always view how it's chosen to route you, so you can always take a peek at what's in there. Interacting with the nav screen. Always thermometer is in the top left. Your compass is always in the top center. Your clock, if you press on that, it'll bring up the date and time. Your vehicle location is an interactive button. You can always tap on that and get details about where you are. From having that detail screen up, and we'll cover this on another slide, but when you have that detail screen up, you can save that as a favorite. You can save it as a location, destination, um, all by a press. And you can do that while you're moving. You can do that while you're stationary. It doesn't matter. Um, how many know this part? If you tap on, this is called the information box. And when you're under route guidance, it will appear. And what you see here are checkered flags. And it's telling you that you're going to arrive at your destination at 
So you see I was leaving at 10.53, so that's basically 11 hours from now it's going to be planned on us arriving at the destination. There's three different screens that you can bring up by tapping on that box. Default is destination arrival time. Next is estimated time en route, and that's always the clock, and it's basically telling you've got 12 hours and 8 minutes left in your journey. That will count down as you drive. And last one is how many miles to go. So in this case, it was a 795-mile trip. So all you have to do is when this screen is up, touch anywhere above this gray line. On, on the time, on the flags, it doesn't matter. Touch on that, and you can cycle through these three boxes. I see a hand up. Yes, sir. Sir. Uh, another Via Nav product I'm using, all three of those bits of information are shown on one part of the screen at the same time. Which system? This is uh, my, our terrain, our GMT terrain. The terrain, okay. Uh, is there an opportunity to do that here? Yes, there is an opportunity, but there is, we, and when I talk about an opportunity, I'm talking about in a future system. No. It's going to be no, it will not be. No, if the information that we talk about today um, is going to cross pretty good to a 16, so that won't be in, but with a quick tap, at least it's available there for you. Paul? Yes, sir. Uh, is there a way to tell between uh, one and two up there which one you looked at? You looked at it? Between the 10 and 1 and the 12 and Absolutely. Here you've got the checkered flags, so that's, it, it's, that's your finish line, if you will. And here you have the clock, the face of the clock, and the face of the clock is saying time. So in this case, it's, it's ETA, uh, excuse me, ETE, estimated time en route. I noticed that it doesn't take into account time zone change. It does not, that's correct. And then all of a sudden it was 9.53. Yeah. So we should have been there three minutes, whatever. Yep. And then all of a sudden, uh, a few miles down the road, we up to cross the time zone. Cross time zone. And then it updates. Yep. The, the time zone will draw it from the GPS satellite. So until you're in proximity of that geofence, it's not going to update that. So it's only working with the best information that it has at the time. It is not predicting when you're going to cross over. Be a nice feature. I, I, I like that personally. Um, it's also lazy. Sometimes it's not very quick about updating, so keep that in mind. When, when you've crossed over the time zone change, you might see your phone go faster than the GPS. I had one person approach me this morning. There's, they went on a trip from here um, up north, and it updated fine going north, so into um, out of central time into eastern time. And when they came back, as of today, it still hadn't updated. And I don't have an explanation for that. Um, I will try to get an answer, but that, that one was a mystery to me. Um, the second, uh, of course. I, I read, and maybe you'll tell us there's a way to get it to set the time so it syncs with our phone. Is that not correct? The time shouldn't sync with your phone. It's an automatic system time. So if you have your phone plugged in, it does talk to your phone with either the cable connection. It won't do it via the Bluetooth connection. But the automatic time change should be just satellite feed. So that should be coming down in the, in the transmission that it's receiving from the satellite. Good? OK. Um, the next part of that box is the detail box. And you can see, um, I unfortunately cut it off when I cropped this photo, but it's just like a little lined piece of paper. If you touch anywhere in the body of the box under root guidance, you'll get a turn list. And this screen is telling you that in three-tenths of a mile, you're going to turn right on South Park Place. In 270 feet after that, you're going to arrive. In this case, I'm arriving at a waypoint. Okay? And this is scrollable, and if you have a waypoint in, if you tap this again, you can manage waypoints, and I'll talk a little bit to that uh, on a future slide. Um, but basically, so that's, that's the content of that information box that comes up on your screen. The top quarter of it basically will say is changing your route arrival time and display information, and then the body of it is going to display your turn-by-turn um, -turn list. 
So we talked about navigation screen viewing preferences early on. These are slides illustrating the, the three choices. So basically, heading up, north up, and 3D. Uh, important to note, 3D is a alternate view of heading up. It just tips the map at a slight angle so that you're looking at it sort of like you were looking down the road. It skews the map's scale, so things closer to you are larger, things further away from you are smaller. It's a little bit disturbing when you're driving and trying to follow it and see what's coming up, so not a lot of people like it. Um, but if you tap on that icon at any point, it will cycle through these three maps, and you can just keep cycling until your heart's content all through your trip. Submenus. This is the submenu, or your quick launch bar. So when the car comes to you from the factory, these are your three defaults. It's basically your audio, your telephone, and your navigation. If you tap up there, you can um, bring up quick launch any one of those features. From a, nav, uh, from a nav screen, if you've got the map up, under route guidance or not, if you tap the screen, the quick launch bar will appear. Um, after a time delay of not interacting with the screen, it will disappear. So touch the screen, bring up that if you want to go to the phone menu very quickly without having to cycle through menu or home and then go find the phone icon. You can also modify that menu and manage those icons. If you press and hold any of those icons, you'll change the screen into edit mode. And from here, you can add additional icons to the quick launch screen, as you see. I've, for illustration purposes, I've now created up to, you can have up to five, so for illustration purposes, I went ahead and put five up there. And you do that by just pressing and holding. When you see these brackets appear, it'll say edit mode down the bottom. Put your finger on one of the icons and just drag it up to that bar. When you're done with it up there, you can delete it and it will not affect its location on your home screen. It won't bother. You can just add and remove them from the quick launch menu. Yes, yeah, you could add it the, the audio portion of my link and move around all of the other icons. So yes? I don't have the slide transitions hooked up to the pointer. I'm simply using it for the laser. So I'm, if you see me going like this and nothing's happening, maybe remind me that I'm having a bad day. You can just drag one of these off of that menu once you've put it up there. And it will scale this back to four. That icon will disappear. And it won't affect its placement over here or otherwise. It's just allowing you to add and subtract from that quick launch menu. Just drag it back down. Yep. And, and that's, that's deleting it from the quick launch menu, but it's not deleting the software or the icon from the home page. Everything else remains exactly the same. I heard a, I heard a couple of. Snowflake? No, no. For those of us that spend a great deal of our time in Florida, no, you cannot change the annoying snowflake to anything else. It wants to remind you that it's the weather and weather is normally irritating. <laughs> so think of it that way. Uh, how did you get to this thing? Oh, uh, very simple. Um, press and hold any icon on the page. Just press and hold and if, if, if you're an iPhone user, when you press and hold an icon on your iPhone, it starts to wiggle. This is the low cost version of that. We don't wiggle. Um, we, simply put, we simply put brackets around it, and you'll see edit mode appear, and you can press the menu key or the back button, and it will turn edit mode off when you're done. And then you just drag it to the top of the screen. Yep, then you just, once, once you're in edit mode, so press and hold, and you'll see the brackets appear. Then with your finger back on it, whatever icon you want to put up there, just grab and drag it across the face of the other icons and deposit it up there. Much the same down the bottom, you have an interactive menu. It's again time sensitive. If you don't interact with the screen, it will fade off so you get a bigger map view. Um, 
So basically here you've got zoom in and zoom out which adjusts your map scale from anything between 150 feet and 500 miles. If you're trying to drag to a, a destination, for example, that's several hundred miles away, you can zoom out, you can drag the map there and then zoom it back in. Um, once you've moved off of the map's centered location where it's paying attention to your driving and your vehicle is centered on the map, um, if you've moved off of that location intentionally or by mistake, you can simply press reset. That'll always bring you back to the vehicle centered on your map, um, like you see there. And when you want to interact and enter a destination, and that's any destination, um, you do so with this screen here. And when you want to get to the navigation specific menu, as we talked about earlier under configuration, that's the menu button. Or you could use the hard key menu there. They both do exactly the same thing. So what do we know? Um, we can enter a destination by voice recognition or screen entry. Addresses via streets, intersections, or freeway on-ramps. Recent destinations, right here. And if you've ever looked in your recent destinations, it has every place you've ever been. Scroll to the bottom of the list. The very first place you went to when you got your shiny new Corvette is going to be on your list. And is, it, it will do that until your memory gets full. And then it will start removing the oldest of the destinations. Um, you can interact with your contacts, either saved to vehicle or paired from, from a paired phone. Um, points of interest. You can create custom POIs and enter them, and I talk a little bit about the end of that, but there's also a tutorial for your ability to do that on the CD that I've, I've got. And then lastly, destination saved as favorites. So when you're entering it will keyboard autocomplete, so pay attention to that. If you're entering a second destination that's similar to a previous one, you'll see the, the letters change in color as it recognizes them and adds them to the list. Um, you can easily hit enter at the wrong time and get unpredictable results. So it's a very, very subtle color change that it happens as it's autocompleting, but it's a progressive search. It will be refined with subsequent, sub subsequent keystrokes. Um, the more good information you can give the system, the better, and I say that very specifically, the more good information, the more known, valid information that you enter in that line will help the interaction go more smoothly and keep the frustration level low. Um, the system will always display how it understood the entry. So it's going to, after you've entered on the keypad and hit enter, results are grouped by full address first, that match, then states, then cities, then intersections, and then streets. They're shown by group, by distance. So what that means is within these grouped results, it's going to group them in those categories down the list by distance. And the system uses logic to enhance those results. It pays attention to places that you've been before. It looks at your recent destinations list. Um, so it's going to try to do what you want it to do on its own. And sometimes as a result of that thought process, it complicates the data entry. So destination address is the address icon there. Um, if you are in Florida and you type in 350 Corvette Drive and go, because everybody knows 350 Corvette Drive is the Corvette Museum, the nav doesn't. The nav is going to look for 350 Corvette Drive where you are. Remember using your Garmin. This is the one time I'm going to give a positive reference to Garmin. Garmin mitigates this error because the first thing it wants you to tell it is where you want it to look. You have to enter that before you can go any further. You have to tell it what city to search in. You have to tell it where you want it to search. Is it the city that I'm in? Is it another city by zip code? This system assumes when you start typing, it, you're going to be looking for someplace close in proximity. So it's going to use the entire database by proximity to start. So 350 Corvette Drive, as it turns out, there's a 350 Corvette Avenue in Sebring, Florida. And then there's a Corvette, another Corvette Avenue on south, um, Corvette Drive in Tampa, Florida. And see, I, I was in Titusville, Florida when I was making these requests of the system. However, if I refine my search simply by putting a comma, space, and the zip code, only one choice. So, and I, I showed people this with the C6 system as well. The, the C6 system would use whatever region you were in and it would search the entire database. So if you did Main Street, Bowling Green, if you did Main Street, 
it's going to find every single Main Street in the database within hundreds of miles. If you ask it for Main Street with a zip code modifier, it's going to narrow that down nicely. Um, this is what I was talking about progressive searches. This, this photograph, unfortunately, didn't come as good as I wanted it to. But you see this is a brighter white than the second half of this. It knew that I had already entered my home address previously. And as I was typing it in, I hit go too quickly. You see that's already illuminated. I hit go too quickly. And it says, sorry, I have no idea where you are. And it knows full well where I was intending to go. But if you're not paying attention to what shows up on the display and how it's telling you what it recognizes and what it's seen previously, um, simplest way to avoid that is just use the X and just back out any of the additional information and then start fresh with a new entry there. And again, pro providing as much accurate information as possible is always going to yield the best results. And missing information, and missing can simply mean you see it on the screen, but your cursor is right here. If you hit enter at that point, it's missing some key points that, that it needed to figure out where you wanted to go. <laughs> the autocomplete is automatic. The autocomplete will begin filling information in from the first time you've entered information into the system. So autocomplete doesn't exist until you've started asking it to go places. When your recent destinations list starts filling up, then it's going to start drawing from that database. But if you typed in halfway, it has to hit it right. You can move the cursor to the end and X out from there. You can just tap on the end with your finger and just position the cursor, much like you were interacting with a tablet, only slower. Okay, cover that one. Sorry, folks. Um, it will do intersections. So I talked about Main Street. Give it the street information that you want to give it. Give it the town, and it quickly will come back. And, and again, always in a list. It's always list format, and then it will display the results on a map when you select one of the category results. So entering a street in a zip code will generate a search result showing matching streets and intersections. So East Main Street and State Street in Bowling Green, Kentucky is the most likely one. So that came up as number one. Um, this one had Maine in it, A-I-N, or as close to Maine as it could find. So it picked that one up. Um, same thing with St. Joseph's and Lawrence Avenue, but all in Bowling Green because it did read the zip code portion. If you had excluded the zip code, these results would have been far wilder and from many different locations. So contact integration, my favorite part. Um, system has access to two different contact lists. It has it, access to a contact list that you create as you save information to the vehicle. So you can dial a phone number and then you have the choice of saving it. You can enter an address and you have the choice of saving it. You can put in a point of interest destination. You have the choice of saving it. You can interact with all of that. You can rename it. You can arrange it. You can edit it. The save contacts are available to both systems, um, even if you've changed contact lists. So to, to bring up the other list, you simply here you see there's no content at that point in the vehicle contacts. And if you've not saved anything, that's the screen that you should see. When you've paired a device, you just want to click on change contact list and change, in this case, change to my iPhone. And then it becomes accessible to my cell phone contact list. It's, it's been healthy for me because I have a lot of very cryptic entries in my contact list as I jot things down and put them in. Somebody gives me their phone number. I may not do really well about putting their name or bothering to get an address or otherwise. Um, the system at least understands which ones have addresses, which ones don't. It will download a snapshot of your contact list. This is very important. If you're in your house and you download an address, you put it in your contact list on your phone, and you run out to the car because you didn't know where you were going, now you've got the address, you run out to the car, hop in the car, start it up, hook your phone up, and go scrolling for it in the list, odds are it's not going to be there. It downloads a contact list takes a snapshot of that so that it will give you access to information it already had the next time you get in the car. It takes a moment for that to refresh and you'll see it happen. The screen will blank out for a second and then your contacts will redraw. And those are the stages of it refreshing. 
it, it's frustrating because you know you just put it in your phone, you can hold up your phone and you can see the contact, but you bring up the contact list on your screen and unfortunately what you just put in isn't there. Give it a minute and it will appear. It's sensitive to formatting, but as long as you follow the, the formatting that your phone gives it, first name, last name, company name, phone number, address, if you don't do a lot of crazy things, um, it gets easily confused if you put first and last name on the first name line. It doesn't know which one to sort on. Um, if you've asked the contact list, for example, to sort on last name and you have a contact that's all entered on the first name line, it's not going to present it to you because it doesn't have a last name as far as it can tell. It doesn't know that John Smith, first name, is actually John Smith. Um, contact button is where you want to get. Um, so once you've selected your Bluetooth device, you can bring it up. Everything that has a checkered flag next to it, and this is what I was talking about, it man helping you manage your contacts. Yes, sir? Does not. No, it will actually do it better through the Bluetooth. It's optimized for the iPhone Bluetooth connection. So you can plug it in. The plugging in of the iPhone is more for music playback and searching. It then becomes an MP3, a different type of MP3 device. The um, MyLink system is sensitive to the connection technology, and each of the software developers handle that slightly differently. So depending upon the version of software that's on your phone, the brand of phone that you're using, their version of the, the developer's OS, be it Android operating system, Windows operating system, or um, Apple's iOS, they interact differently. Bluetooth has some minimum standards that they're required to meet. So by virtue of that, if you stick with the Bluetooth pairing, you'll get the most feature set unless you're trying to scroll through and sort your music, then it's a different story. Plugged in is better for music playback, but not, not as much a concern for this. So any, any contact with a checkered flag has an address that can be navigated to. Um, the ones that don't, can't be, it either couldn't read the address, doesn't understand the address, or there is not an address present. So this is a good way to check up on if everything you wanted in your phone is in your phone. Um, so. You have, like we talked about, the last is contact selected by vehicle list or connected Bluetooth device. So you've brought up a destination. You have the ability to save it as a destination to the vehicle. Um, you can create a new contact or you can add it to an existing contact. This will save it to your vehicle save list, your vehicle favorites list. Um, vehicle save list, don't con I don't want to confuse that with favorites. We'll talk about, fa I have a whistle? Ah, yes. Yep. And this one, it's already out there. The system has what's called a geofence. And the geofence is different on the C7 system than it was on the C6 system. And basically what the geofence is, is it's an invisible radius around the contact that you're going to or to that point. And it, it is specifically generated by the database of the navigation people, Navtech or Teleatlas, in our case it's Navtech. And if the destination that you want to go to is here, and from here to here is the geofence, if the database has that address actually in a slightly different location, you will arrive at it, but it will not terminate the trip. Very easily. Um, hit the menu button. So the hard key round uh, menu button with the ring around it. When you press that, the very, very first thing that comes up on top of that menu list is cancel guidance. So press, press, and you're done. Okay. Interesting. I, I, do you have your car with you? Okay. Would you mind um, maybe a separate session outside of this? I'd like to see that. 
because if they're in your phone, they should eventually appear on the contact list. It might be a naming convention issue because the way things come out of uh, Outlook is sometimes comma-separated values, um, sometimes tab-delimited values, and it depends on how the list is sequenced, and it just may not see them. So I'd like, to, I'd like to try two things. I'd like to look at one that you know you imported from Outlook, and I'd also like to look at one that we enter while we're sitting there. So catch me. I, I, I'm not going to get any better looking. What you see is what you get. If you see me running around, grab me, and if I have a chance, we'll go, and if not, we'll set a time and go out and do it. I'm here for the, the event, though. Points of interest. Um, again, that's the button that you're looking for, the little push pins on the map. It's right down in the lower right-hand corner of your destination menu. Um, interacting with POIs is very useful. I use it a ton when I'm traveling. Um, you have a lot of neat options. Uh, POIs are searched by name, by category, category name and phone number, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of fun things with POIs. Um, it's always gonna present you the first 20 options and then it will scroll through the next 10, the next 10 when you show more results. Um, scrolling the map is gonna update the POIs and what I mean by that is when you've brought up your, selected a POI, this map updates and it'll show you the numbers associated with the POIs on your list and it will display them on this map and if you scroll the map, you'll see more of the information on the list that it will update. First, first very important tip, if you're under route guidance, search for POIs that are along route so that it doesn't take you very far out of your way. The way that you get there is by pressing on the search near button, that's actually an interactive key on the detail screen. So when you press the POI key, the first thing you're gonna be presented with is how it's searching currently. So in this case, it's searching POIs nearby and you will always get a category list. No matter how you go about this, it's always gonna give you a list by category. But it's gonna give you a list by category refined in one of the following ways. If you're under root guidance, there are four choices. You can search for a POI along your guidance route. You can search for a POI nearby to your current location, and that returns results proximity by distance. You can search for something near your destination. You set off in the car, you're gonna need a hotel for the night, you don't have one yet, you can click on near destination and then go to the hotels list from the POI list that comes up here and you can just search on hotels and it's only gonna be looking near your destination. And then the last one is a fun one, it's another location. If you wanna search for hotels in Honolulu, Hawaii while you're in Bowling Green, you can. Um, press another location, Press type in 96815, which is the zip code for Honolulu, and it will give you a list of POIs in that area, um, which is useful if you're planning a trip or if you're looking for a destination that's in another town but you're not under route guidance to that destination. Does that make sense to everyone? Everybody use that already? Did anybody know it was there? All right. Um, yes? Of course. To, and, and, I, and I apologize for that. If you have the map screen up like is normally displayed, if you tap the map screen, just a momentary touch, this menu, not this menu, bad Paul. Um, the, this menu will appear if you, no, I'm sorry, destination from the main screen and then this from destination. So I think I have. Well, I deserve that. <clears throat> Make sure he gets two CDs. Oh, that was good. Thank you for that. That was excellent. I will fix that for Saturday, I promise you. Right. Type, tap the map screen. Menu will appear. The menu that's going to appear is zoom in, zoom out, reset, 
Destination, menu. No, not, I mean, I'm trying to walk you through from the very beginning. If you're driving along and your map is displaying under route guidance or not, it's irrelevant. If, you're, if your map is up, your vehicle position is showing. Momentary tap on the screen will bring up the first level menu. The first level menu starts with zoom out, zoom in, reset, destination. Type press destination. This is the next menu that you will see. And we're working now with, with the POIs. So press the POI key. And that will give you this. Once you've typed, touched the POI, and right now it's, it's POI is a long route, but that was changed by the search near. So that'll present you with the, the category list. And when you type on search near, that will make these modifications. The tutorial in the CD actually has a very detailed walkthrough of this for sure. And